I would like to give you this overview of what is AI for good. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce myself. So when I was a child, I used to play the piano for many hours. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have TV at home. So uh, when I was 13, I won a national competition of piano. So 20 years later, I was doing my PhD uh, on uh, music analysis and using computers to analyze music. Um, and then we submitted some algorithms to the Myrex uh, for the uh, discovery of repeated themes and sections. Uh, so uh, the news, they made this nice report of us. And now, uh, if we talk about the impact of technology uh, in music, uh, we introduced scores. So that was first the first big change in the way that we transmit music. It was not oral, but also we had now a reference of what I really want to transmit with my uh, ideas. And then, actually today, music has changed dramatically, right? So in a short period of time, uh, technology has changed the way that we do everything with music, right? So we uh, are not necessarily close to the source of uh, the music, but we can actually listen to music from anywhere in the world, around the world. And then technology changed everything. So the way we learn uh, music, the way we archive, retrieve, consumption, of course, is, is uh, some a big topic. Uh, the way that we compose music and everything. So today, probably, most composers look like this, right? Sitting in this stu studio and doing some work. And then most music is now consumed by stream, right? I was the other day uh, reading about how Bach composed so much music in a lifetime. And it was impressive that uh, he started composing on Mondays. Uh, he finished uh, writing, he had to uh, write for different uh, parts of violinists, viola, the singers, until Friday. Saturday he delivered the scores, they rehearsed, and Sunday they played in the church. So it was amazing, and today we have technology that helps us uh, do our job. But now, for example, we are uh, entering a new uh, cycle. Now it's robots in our societies also interacting with us and maybe being creative. Uh, they also have some expressivity, right? So we are modeling that. Uh, let's talk two minutes in pairs. So what's your thoughts on this? Should we start in the back? Yes, I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know if there are several things within the, the sentence, but from one side the fact that Maybe tools can replace humans. Okay, so then we I mean, it might be better to not have servant or slaves in the sense of other people doing something for us, but maybe other, having, having tools might be better. And uh, so, so actually, the thought was we could interpret it in, in a way that someone who's like enslaved. Uh, doesn't have to do this work anymore because we have some tool and these people could do some other things so in, to free them uh, but on the other hand we, we could also be interpreted in a way like replace some some humans with tool whatever it is and we don't need the people anymore at all so it can have something positive and negative in it mm -hmm. would you like to compliment yeah so uh, I think uh, certain has a really nice point where it's uh, kind of the opposite. You know, well, I don't want to speak yeah, uh, well, for like, it. Like, so <laughs> what we discussed was about if uh, a tool is not used uh, in a way to complement humans, for example. Like, uh, so our uh, topic di diverged into uh, talking about like streaming services and recommender systems and how they might actually make the musicians, especially not the high earning ones in this context, uh, slaves or servants because they are not really either, they are not uh, in the front anymore because the uh, services don't really show them mm -hmm. or it might be just uh, their 
earnings uh, because of the way the economy now works is diminished so much that they actually cannot be full-time musicians. Mm -hmm. so. But before streaming, uh, for some artists, it was impossible to have something on the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. So you would have to be a superstar to be in, in a streaming service or in a CD, for example. Yes. But now technology allowed any independent musician also to yes. to have their voice out there, even though, of course, they may not be promoted as other musicians. Right? Yeah, and. Um, they they don't learn anything. Yeah, that's the bigger problem. But it's, it's like um, like uh, just putting it to some other point. Before it was the pre-selection of which artists could be would be promoted and have their albums and what's on. Now more people can put stuff on there, but it's still a selection. Yes. That um, promoted and it's not the same companies or just part of the same companies that decided. So it's. It's again a, a, a selection, so it's just that you have a recording out there doesn't mean that it's, it's, but it means it's out there. Yeah, and then what we actually mm -hmm. discussed a lot, it was exactly what you were saying, like, it is about how you purpose the tool. Um, like, you might have all the versatility, but if you just want to use it in a way, for example, for the company's profit, then if you don't care about the artists in this context, then it will make them service or space. So that was, I guess, more or less what we thought. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's not only in, I think it's not only uh, something that introduced the streaming service, the fact that uh, the musicians have to play what um, people want, not, not what they want, so that makes them slaves. <laughs> but it's not related with the things. It has been always like that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's actually, actually... That's something I saw like, after like, we discussed it. We also discussed that, that like, um, if, if there's some event outside, we're having food and we want some band to play, uh, maybe there's the order to play some not heavy metal, but play some jazz ballad. So that's already telling other people what to do. Um, yeah. So, uh, and the the word slave is really hard it's for me to so like. Sorry, guys. And and here in the translation, it's service, service and slave. Service sounds service. nice, uh, nice. Like sounds for me, it's it's more more pleasant word. Okay. Um, it's how you proceed. Would you like to share your thoughts? It's pretty much. Yeah. It's pretty yeah, pretty in line with what everybody else is mentioning. Well, we talked a little bit about you know, probably when Aristotle proposed this, it was maybe for an ethically good thing. He's thinking, oh we don't need to have slaves at all because we can just you know eventually develop tools that will do all of these jobs. Um, but if you think about it in the sort of modern context, now we worry about things like human workers being replaced by robots or whatever else. Um, so it's it's almost like this very thin line, it's very easy to flip back and forth depending on the context and how the technology is being used. But I question, so a CD player or a yeah. radio replaced musicians, do you think? Somehow in some, like, you can have events with uh, just recorded music playing and you can have an event where we have live music playing, it's, it's like, it's a shift from one to the other. I think it really depends on the context. I don't know. If you are a live musician, it ends up making your work quite a bit more. Not only do you need to play all of your live shows, try to generate profit from that, you also need to now produce all of these recordings. Whereas but how about you want to be known? And then how people know you exist? So you have to have a recording exactly. before everybody knows you, but so you can we have to yourself. We have to consider that um, what is an artist. So there's someone doing the songwriting, someone who does the recording of the original, but that there are, there are also professional musicians like playing at an event, playing cover songs, and maybe there's not even a desire to be the top charts. It's like 
I want to play my guitar and I play do it really well and I can do the covers. And it's a different kind of profession and I don't need to have recordings on that if you want to live musician. Mm -hmm. So that's a uh, Different but role, if you're an organizer a of a, you're an organizer yeah. and you want to select someone because they have special quality in their performance, mm -hmm. which one do you pick? You don't know them. Maybe you need some reference, right? Yeah. And then you have perhaps a recording of this person, and then you can decide. Ah, I like this performance. I, yes, guess, I, course, guess, yeah. uh, I guess it depends on, on the goal of the artist and like if he wants to be like worldwide known or maybe locally. I mean, if it's locally, maybe it's just better to play in the streets and yeah. people will know you. And if you want to be worldwide, then of course it's more difficult to play everywhere live, so you have to record yourself. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's also something where different things in our minds that um, I can do a recording, for instance, of a cover song, put it on the website too. Do the marketing for me, but there is no need at all to put it on on the big streaming platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a totally different thing. But I think when we think about artists, then we usually think about what's on Spotify and Pandora. Yeah. And that's actually just one part of the entire game. But if you want to talk about it, we just have to make clear that we all talk about the same thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of what you had mentioned before, that you know, perhaps some of these sort of streaming sites almost force music to be a certain kind of way in order to get all of the clicks or the likes on YouTube or Spotify. Um, you know, if you're if you're working in certain genres, you're just not going to get very much attention anyways. You get like loads and loads and loads of pop content in your top 100, not a lot of anything else. And I think if you're going back to this sort of live aspect, there's this expectation to perform certain things. I, know, I do a lot of cl classical music and the amount of stuff that gets programmed that's new, even if it is known, is very, very minimal because people only want to hear certain things. They don't get any exposure to anything that's you know, not the top 10 composers or something like this. So yeah. It's hard because you do get some people have now an ability to share their music online without having to pay for um, you know, any sort of uh, CD making or record printing, anything like this. They can just upload content. It makes it a lot more accessible for people who they're working with a low budget, but I don't know if it necessarily really brings that much of a spotlight to these people. Okay, so we just move on. And how about talk about science fiction? <laughs> but actually, science fiction is reaching the real life, right? Today. So, uh, actually, these writers, and Chapik was one of the writers that coined the word robot. Uh, they worried about the importance of work for humans. Uh, how about robotic destructive behavior, so a robot that will kill us, or machines awaken rebellion. And actually this worries not only science fiction writers, but philosophers and the AI community today. So uh, just one minute, talk to your partner what you think about this. And um, you were right, Asimov was the one who okay. wrote these uh, three laws. So would you like to read them out loud? The first law? <laughs> okay, you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, yeah, the first law is a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to be come to harm. Uh, the second law, a robot must obey the orders given by, it, by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And the third law, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection doesn't conflict with the first or second law. Okay, so actually science fiction can teach us a lot. What is the zero law? The zero law. Yeah, there is something to tell. It says a small lady and it's a zero law. Oh, to protect humanity's interest. Can you read it? Oh, okay. A robot may not injure humanity or through inaction allow humanity to come to harm. Yeah. And actually, perhaps humans are the ones who, who provoke injury to human humanity, but robots could prevent us to be destructive. But who decides what's harm for humanity? And maybe it's a protection to humanity to kill some people? Just, yeah, 
I think that's what, that was one of the problems in the book, right? I robot. He kind of um, yeah. in the end there was this kind yeah. of. Uh, uh, I don't actually remember the whole book, but I remember that in the end there was this robot that was able to find a hole in all these rules. Yeah, yeah. And, it's like uh, the Charlie problem. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. The limits. Where are the limits, and, and how you define yeah. them? And, yeah. Mm -hmm. How the robot decides which one, like, do I save this person or this person? Yeah. But actually, this is what happens with uh, driver's cars right now, yeah. right? Yeah. So in an accident, the the algorithm has to decide which action will provoke less, less harm, right? Mm -hmm. And then you take uh, life and death decisions, mm -hmm. right? So that's why, why it is now so... That's why human in the loop is uh, important. Many times. Yeah, but uh, actually, the dimension of self driving cars is the, the moral machine where we can try that out on them, and there are cultural differences in perception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. Yeah. challenging. Yeah. Very challenging. Very challenging. Okay, so we go back to music. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, there are different points of view. So, uh, Miriam Cutler is a film composer and she talks about uh, the work of film composers which is brutal uh, they have a lot of work and they warn about young composers about the stress and health issues so that this job is uh, really uh, stressful and she i mean people in this job do not imagine themselves without technology without computers and so on and so forth on the other hand uh, i was in this ai for good summit and there was this drummer, Jojo Mayer, and he complained that technology uh, can kill a little bit the creativity. Or, for example, uh, he recalled that there was a drummer who made a lot of recordings, and when these drumming machines came up to the market, he kind of lost his job. And then people started using these drumming machines, which were, you know, very precise and then, uh, you know, very cost-effective. And they could even do musical patterns which are not reproducible for humans. So as a human, you cannot reproduce something which is very fast and, and difficult. So it kind of blow the mind of uh, some artists. And he was also complaining that perhaps uh, uh, the music that we hear is kind of lacking of creativity. So the patterns that we are used to or exposed to are just, you know, a set or subset. So it provoke harm. Right. So, but if we consider there are different problems they describe and different uses of technology. So, mm -hmm. what do we consider? Actually, uh, if we think of uh, revolutions as a whole, and we consider the first industrial revolution, which was provoked by the steam engine and the railways, and actually at that time the expectancy, the life expectancy, was thirty-five years, which today is almost a double. So these revolutions brought also a lot of wealth in general. And if we consider the second industrial revolution with the electricity as the main uh, motor, and then we have the phonograph which changed also the way that we uh, can uh, access music. And then it's considered 1906, the birth of the uh, recorded music market. Uh, we also have the production line, this helped uh, a little, a lot in the way that we produce and the consequence is that today we have unattended factories, so non-slaves, right? The factories can produce and produce. Uh, the birth of the third digital revolution uh, is propagated through the computers and also in the music industry, so we have the vinyl disc, uh, then we have audio cassettes. So all those uh, innovations came very fast, one after the other. And today uh, there is a wide uh, adoption of smartphones, also online commerce and streaming. So our way of consum consumption has changed everything. And the birth of the fourth uh, or so-called artificial intelligence revolution is thanks to a convolutional neural network which is able to recognize uh, handwritten uh, digits, and I'm going to talk later about this network. And then we have internet, uh, we have self-driving cars, and one uh, new, which was uh, very interesting, was this AlphaGo, 
do you know what is AlphaGo? Yeah. So this blow the mind of many people because this challenges uh, us as humans in our capacities. Uh, uh, so high level strategic capacities. So are we going to drive self-driving cars in the future? Probably we are not going to drive cars anymore in some years because the, the accidents produced by humans are much larger than the ones produced by self-driving cars. And so the companies who insure people would say, okay, we don't give any more insurance to you, you just drive the driver's car. And uh, if you want to drive, then you will have to pay a lot of money to be able to drive a, a car. So probably nobody else will want to drive a car. And the other concern is what happens if machines reach uh, or surpass human intelligence, right? Um, experts consider that this can happen in 2075. Yeah, so we have some years until there. And what are the consequences of that, right? Okay, hold on to your chair. Uh, the people who, the futurists think that we are coming into a this digital cataclysm. So in the next 20 years, we are going to see so much innovations and disruptions, and uh, our life will be changed in a way that is larger than the first and the second revolutions together. And everything is changing very, very fast. So, um, yeah, so there are many changes coming in the next 20 years. What nobody knows is that if it's going to be a utopian world or it's going to be a dystopian world. Nobody knows that, but there are some kind of uh, trends and the way that people think. So there are some people who are, which are optimists, there are the pessimists, the pragmatics and the doubters. And so the optimists think that uh, we are going to live in a, well, in a world with unlimited wealth, uh, with our brains connected to the cloud, and this will be an enhancement of machines and humans' brains. Uh, we are going to have robots doing all tasks that we don't want to do. And we are just going to decide on what, which tasks we are going to do, creative jobs, everything. I don't know. So that's uh, the way that optimists think. The pessimists think that it's very dangerous that machines could reach human intelligence because they can improve recursively themselves and surpass biological intelligence. And when you talk about pessimists, you always see this kind of terminator picture. Um, actually, machines could take better decisions than us, and then perhaps we are not going to decide anymore. So that's the way view of the pessimists. It's not going to be a bad world, but humans may not be motivated to do things, right? Because machines can do better. So we are going to be like a second status uh, uh, being in the earth, uh, we are going to be more or less like a pets to machines. Uh, so that's uh, the way. And of course, there is a lot of uh, question about uh, uh, weapons and uh, artific artificial intelligence weapons that can optimize themselves to kill themselves, and then we can disappear from the earth. There is the pragmatists. And they believe that if we do research on human augmentation uh, and then we work on regulations so we can control uh, artificial intelligence and actually, so there is this uh, human intelligence and there is this machine intelligence which combined could give us enhancement. Finally, the doubters do not believe anything from the previous thing. So they do not believe that we are going to live in a uh, well, uh, world of uh, unlimited wealth. They do not believe that we should be worried about machines because uh, they cannot reach uh, biological intelligence. Um, and actually, there was some uh, excitement in the 70s and nothing happened until now. So we know about general intelligence and narrow intelligence. So they really do not believe that we should be afraid, but we're not going to see this uh, unlimited and so on and so forth. And there is this book that describes uh, what machines cannot do. So, uh, which of these boxes do you belong? So the optimists raise their hands. 
Not optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> the pessimists. Mm -hmm. The pragmatics. Okay, four. And the doctors. Great. So we have a variety of opinions. That's wonderful. <laughs> okay. Um, would anyone like to share why do you stand for any of these? Bills? So for me, the extremes are a long shot. And I, for instance, optimists think that uh, we we won't be we won't need to do anything. So machines will take care of everything. And uh, what we've seen from the past is that okay, machines get improving, but still we are able to have an identity and a life that is shaped by the things that machines can do. But it doesn't mean that we don't have anything to do or we don't have a life, let's say. We still we keep changing our lifestyle <coughs> and, uh, and machines are just helping us on that. that that's, that's my opinion. And pessimists. There was a pessimist here. So what do you think? You are a supporter. <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't know, it's just, I don't trust, mm, I'm pessimist on humanity itself, like, right now we can see the world by humans, how it's going, and how many people are suffering, etc, etc, and so, uh, if machines are done by humans, and one day, once, if, if they reach their own capacity, for the reasons, but they come from humans, we don't know what they are going to think. So, <laughs> we just don't know, and seeing where we are and what we can do, I'm just pessimist. Mm -hmm. Anyone else would like to share? Well, I have some doubts, so, but I'm a, I'm a doctor, but also pessimist, so I'm, I'm kind <laughs> of in the middle, but in general I think that People tend to react and to think, think that maybe we are reaching some kind of strange level, but most of the people that maybe are worried or are optimistic about it still don't know what we are doing with artificial intelligence. So, to, to, be, to look beyond and see yeah, what will be better or will be worse, it's kind of still, I mean, it's difficult to say. Yeah, just, just to add something on pessimists, I'm more afraid of what humans can do if uh, we have such powerful technology. So I'm not afraid of, of the uh, machines themselves. So the machines can be powerful, but I don't think that by themselves they will do bad things to humanity. Uh, I think I think it will be always triggered by humans, but just just a theory. That's really good. I think I think that's like a very optimistic way of thinking. Like, <laughs> if if we control the machines, machines are going to be bad. But once they control themselves, they're going to be good. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think they will reach a level in which they I control. I think they won't be bad enough. It, it could, you could think about it that way, though. Like what you're saying. Oh, okay. If, if humans are the ones designing machines, then they are inherently flawed because humans are inherently flawed. <laughs> they would use their powers for evil. But if you had this point where robots surpassed human intelligence and they were truly making good decisions, they might, you know, get over the sort of human greed or whatever other. But let's say exist. machines do not know what is good or bad for humans. So, for example, they just want to optimize a solution problem. Yeah. And that's their goal, and they are very motivated to do that. And for that, they need all electricity, so they use electricity for a week, and we don't have electricity at all. Same on Plague Horizon so, Zero Dawn. Yeah, so that's that's their objective, which maybe it's not going to yeah. kill us. Maybe yes, I don't know. But, but maybe it's overall good for humanity. We don't know. Uh, it's like, no, it's, it's also the definition what's good and bad, and is it for overall... I mean, but maybe they just the not earth consider earth ourselves. Just, yeah. I mean, they just consider they want to solve this problem. Yeah. Probably there will be this other machine which controls the electrical grid, which wants to optimize uh, that others don't uh, <laughs> eat up more than they should. So, 
or or the machine will find uh, electrical resources by itself, like uh, sustainability in the loop. I, I mean, I'm pessimistic if I think in a humanity way. If I think more in a universe or nature in general, maybe humans doesn't have to exist. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I mean, I think there are like two things. Um, uh, first, that what is good or bad, it's uh, not clear, not even for us. Mm -hmm. Maybe we, we can argue that. And, uh, and 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 also, I think that general intelligence is not going to happen in, in the like many years. We are not close to that for sure. So we shouldn't worry about that. And what is intelligence? Also? And what is intelligence? <laughs> and I, I want to start by saying that we don't know what is intelligence so far, but we are using artificial intelligence as our <laughs> ground. So. Okay, great. So now, uh, this is just to tell you that the views uh, are also kind of biased through your cultural background. And so if you come from uh, the US, probably you will associate uh, machines or robots more with a Terminator kind of scary look. And if you come from Asia, you will associate robots more than with a friendly and nice look. Okay. So, uh, talking about artificial intelligence definitions, uh, the term was introduced in 1956. Uh, and then uh, research on machine learning started uh, very soon. And so, uh, it was not until uh, 2012 that deep learning uh, came with a lot of force uh, because they uh, surprisingly uh, beat it, uh, some results that we are going to see later on, right? And uh, if we define a little bit what is uh, this, so a computer program learns if its performance at a certain task improves with experience. So in the 60s there were great expectations after machines came, so they said that within a generation, the problem of creating artificial intelligence will substantially be solved. And then uh, in 1965, uh, this Nobel Prize economist said machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a man can do. So at that time, uh, actually, they were very excited, but then nothing really uh, happened. So there was this paradox, right? So uh, computers. Uh, could solve uh, theorems or geometric problems, which is very hard for humans, actually. But they could not solve tasks which are re really easy for us, like recognizing faces, speech, and then a one-year-old kid can do that. Or motricity, right? So it was this paradox of what computers can do and what we can do as humans that, uh, perhaps talking about general intelligence, right? And so, if we consider, uh, for example, uh, the Imaginet, does anyone doesn't know what is the Imaginet competition? Everybody knows, right? So, uh, in the introduction, so 2010 and 2011, they were using uh, Fisher vectors and uh, compression and S SBMs, so th those were the error rates. But then, in 2012, they started using convolutional neural networks, which were trained in GPUs. So, the, the jump was uh, dramatic. And then after that, all algorithms were using convolutional neural networks, right? Uh, so this is human uh, error rates. And then with 152 layers, uh, actually machines are much, uh, not much better, but they are better than humans, right? So um, actually convolution is a mathematical operation which was described in 1754, and then it was extensively used by Fourier, Poisson, and Cauchy. And actually, if we see a convolution of two dimensional signals, so it's an operation of uh, y and w. So we have here our, um, our function, and this will be our filter, which is translating to this uh, function that we want to analyze. And then the output is just a filtered version of that. Uh, there was nothing new, 
right? But what uh, neural networks did was to learn automatically these filters. And that's the key of uh, convolutional neural networks. So they can learn automatically from the data which are the filters that we are going to use. So, uh, in 1906, uh, Santiago uh, Ramón y Cajal uh, won a Nobel Prize because he was the first one to describe that our brain uh, functions thanks to neurons and the interconnections. And, um, yeah, he, do he made these uh, nice drawings. Actually, his father wanted him to be a painter, and then he became a scientist, and he was able to draw very nice. Um, and so, in, in 1962, there was also a discovery uh, that our brain has these simple, complex, and hypercomplex cells. So these simple cells um, uh, get excited to uh, lines, for example, and they are excited to specifically one orientation of line, and then there is another group of cells which get excited to this orientation, for example, and so on and so forth. Those would be the simple cells. And the complex cells uh, take this information in the next layer, and then the patterns that they can recognize are a bit more complex, and then this is this hierarchical processing of information until uh, very abstract concepts. And so this uh, neural network was used to actually model that. So when we have uh, an input, could be an image for example, then we apply convolution, that would be our kind of uh, simple cells, which are more kind of uh, edge detectors. And then we have a pooling operation, which uh, aggregates information in, in an area, and then uh, images get smaller. And then we apply again convolution, and again pooling, and so on and so forth. So this uh, hierarchical processing uh, through convolution and pooling is similar to what we do in our brains to process information. And actually, this is uh, what I was talking about, the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution or the artificial intelligence revolution. So this is attributed because hand uh, digits, uh, you know, they have variability and these networks are able to be robust to this variability in the data. So, and it was not only the architecture, but it was also thanks to the GPUs thanks to lots of lots of data and uh, developments in the algorithms, right, that make uh, deep learning successful. So if we consider what is uh, style, creativity and perception, so they are kind of linked, right, so what we perceive, we are able to recognize as a style, but we are also able to create from that. And uh, maybe you know this uh, research, Um, so they uh, show that they can uh, transfer style, so for example you have one image, you learn uh, the filters of, for example, one style of painting and then you can transfer it to this uh, style, right? So this is kind of interesting and the same but we can apply to music. Great! Uh, very briefly, so how good are we at these different tasks in our community? So, uh, composer identification, mode classification, genre, uh, pattern prediction, how about music generation? We don't have uh, yet uh, evaluation for that, right? But actually, uh, we are... Evaluation for the other. Well, this is from the Myrix, so this is... Oh, okay. uh, that's the reference. That was uh -huh. my reference, the Myrix, right? So, <laughs> that was my reference. Uh, but actually, as a human, we are okay uh, that machines uh, do these automatic tasks, but we kind of get bo uh, kind of, uh, yeah, something bothers us when we talk about music, music generation and machines being very creative. I don't know you, but some people get kind of nervous. So, what is the view of the Izmir? Last year we had a session where we talked about ethics uh, and so on and so forth. And I checked in the website if the Izmir has some guidelines about uh, uh, ethics. I couldn't find anything. So, probably it's today, uh, the day where we are going to gather 
and we are going to write a small document and perhaps propose this to our community uh, to see if we can have something very official as a community. Okay, so as I said, there are different movements today about uh, AI for good, so there is uh, all of these uh, conferences, there are projects, and also governments have AI strategies. Uh, people think that if we concentrate to solve one of these goals, so we are contributing to, uh, to have a better world, right? So probably, uh, yeah, I don't know how our community can uh, be part of this uh, initiative, but we can certainly think about it. Right, so there are different. Yes, so uh, people think that it's really possible that we achieve these 17, 17 goals and we can have a human augmentation, uh, human uh, to improve our intelligence and capabilities, and we can empower non experts. But there are several things to consider. So, how about misuse and manipulation? of monopolies. How about uh, there are large repositories of data but they are concentrated in few hands and we know that we were discussing yesterday about that. Um, how about job transformation? Uh, what is people going to do if machines automate their jobs? And can we trust systems which are poorly designed? So what happens if we take our decisions based on that? So one minute discuss with your partner about these issues. So we were having an interesting discussion about uh, trustworthy of these systems. So uh, we were saying that we should always have a way of opting out of these technologies when uh, when we don't trust them or when we don't trust their results, so that uh, we we don't get in a system that is manipulating us or making us making bad decisions. But again, we need to have some mechanism to measure trust on this system and measure if it's worth uh, using this system. And uh, this can be a challenge for, for, for users, for individuals. So I have two points for that. The one thing is, uh, if you say, OK, I should have the possibility to opt out of the system, but maybe that's uh, opting me out of a social life, like um, social media, when everybody's in there and you say, I don't trust this and I don't use this, but then you don't get some information and you are excluded, it's not inclusive things, for instance, yeah, 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 yeah. things change, but it's it's like, it's not only my own decision, or it's a decision for me, but it has lots of impact on my, yeah. on other aspects of my life. But, it, but it's, on, it's also very much because social media right now don't give you any possibility to opt out in a flexible Well, I, I, I had a colleague, she never participated in anything where she had to register online, kind of, but she also didn't know what we were talking about, for instance, and when people are talking about Facebook, she didn't know what yeah. uh, what it is. So it's, she made this decision for herself, but it was not only opting out of this yeah, one system, it was opting out of a lot of things. Social yeah. circle, um, so that's, that's one thing, so we have to consider that as well. And concerning trust in systems, it's something that we discuss. Um, so sometimes we don't know that some system is not properly designed, uh, so maybe we trust it, but there are also a lot of systems where we actually know that it's not good and we still somehow trust it. Like, for instance, I can see that in research on online self-disclosure, that people, like with the privacy paradox, that people say, I will never give away this kind of information, especially on this platform, and then you observe people doing exactly that, where they say they would never do that. So actually, it's, we know that it's not good, but still, somehow we trust. At least it's maybe just the trust that nothing bad will happen to me. That's also some kind of trust, although we know that there's something maybe not perfect. 
Um, so we also have to, to look on the different sides of the, it's not only two sides of the coin, but it's like different perspectives. Yeah. Uh, these are the two things that relate yeah. to what you said. Would you like to add something? Mm, yeah, I, I guess um, one of the main things we're talking is like, and um, how do you know when you're manipulated, or how do you know when, when something is not mm, properly designed, and how can you trust things that you don't know? Well, for us, um, I think our discussion was more like we don't need artificial intelligence or the negative sides. Like in the context of music, there is a lot of manipulation and there a lot of monopolies in the whole system anyways. And uh, the music industry historically don't trust each other. So there's no information from like the big three to the others, collection societies are uh, themselves are quite uh, obscure and some are practically uh, mafia and I mean the Spanish so collection society got kicked out a few months ago because they were actually doing a lot of manipulation so um, our I think agreement was like we can still we don't need this to become worse but we can use uh, machine uh, assisted technologies uh, to improve this like for example from my perspective many of the things we have to do are related to uh, identifying if this person is the same as that other person in a large data repository and there are no unique identifiers to match because of the trust so people have to do that and uh, given a technology can we actually help uh, humans in the loop so they don't have to deal with like 99% of the stuff so they can actually do uh, more like less manual tasks and uh, hence uh, the musicians the creators will get uh, what they fairly get which is not happening right now so that was the blurb. Um, the one point that, that actually even without AI there's maybe something not so good going on, but AI can reinforce that or mitigate that so then, or just not change anything at all. So it's, yeah, we can use it for good or for bad. And yes. We have to define what good and bad is and what we want to do. That's another thing. And, and that, people enforce it yeah. like they don't use it. But that leads in actually to one point uh, in, on the positive side, so it's, it's mentioned that the positive side it's empowering non-expert users and it depends on the perspective that you take. So for the non-expert user who is empowered, I think that's a positive thing, but it could potentially um, be something negative for the one, like if other people are empowered and someone thinks uh, he is losing, then it's actually a negative implication. So it depends surely on the on the perspective that you take. Yeah, well, some say that the countries that will use AI mm -hmm. to empower their workers, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this technology can also lead the gap of uh, inequality yeah. much larger. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. there is also this risk. Uh, yes, it's also a bit related to the one slide that you had on the um, on the revolutions, let's say. Mm -hmm. When we look at the digital revolution, that uh, the different forms of media, and this is also, I mean, this happens so differently in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, some music cultures never had really the CD mm -hmm. um, and went directly from the cassette to the mobile phone, basically, mm -hmm. for instance. So things happen very differently and will happen also in the next uh, this revolution or whatever revolution in differently different places. So it's, mm -hmm. and, uh, we are thinking about a certain framework in which we live, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and actually, it comes to my mind just now with the job transformation. Yes, that's something that happens and that happened, but maybe it's not. A negative thing, like it can be a positive transformation. 
that you really enjoy a lot and now you have the possibility. So it's not automatically something negative. No. Actually, no. Uh, actually, it's, so it's, it's really difficult to have positive negative on one side because the, it's, it would be a, actually a chaos side. Yes, yeah. now that you have to have there because it depends so much on the different perspective. Well, actually, just as before, yeah. so there are some positive economists and negative yeah. pessimist economists. Some sh say that the, the automation brought in the area where this automation came in uh, improvement mm -hmm. or uh, more economic uh, growth. Mm -hmm. While others think that, for example, if uh, self-driving cars come into the U.S. and there is many people uh, depend on these jobs, what they are going to do, right? So we have to give new skills to these people who are not going to be able to perform the job that they were doing, right? And how do we do that in the smoothest way? Mm -hmm. Okay, so more challenges for you. Uh, <laughs> To discuss, so uh, uh, sorry, uh, so we have to ensure trust, privacy, safety, fairness, and explainability. Uh, avoid bias and poor design. So how how we are going to do that? Uh, how we are going to enforce ethical guidelines, for example, by laws. But in our community, for example, how can we do that? Uh, discuss what are excellent practices, so do we perform data inspection, do we do auditory of systems, one, some publications are out there, or not, oh, sorry, so, again, one minute with your partner to discuss this topic. Can topics. I take a picture to the slide? Sure. <laughs> you can have all the slides. Uh, um, so, we were looking some white lines that were specific for publishing data set, how, how they were collected and this kind of um, and, and and how, how they clean the data and these kind of things. I also was thinking our on more white lines more related with the algorithms. Um, yeah but the, the, the discussion was yeah. Mm -hmm. So one point was that we think everything that's written down there on the slide is Important, and we agreed that we couldn't make any ranking. <laughs> uh, and there are lots of internet dependencies. Um, but at least it was for me, it was very um, kind of it's almost worried concerning how to enforce ethical guidelines. Um, and especially when you come up with something, and maybe you're not an ethical expert, uh, there could be some flaw in it. And if you you enforce that, then you're actually enforcing something where you, you you want to have a fairness in there, but actually you would enforce something that is not fair. So if there's a loop, there is a, some problematic thing in there. Um, and maybe for, for the data inspection, like what would it be? Is it sufficient to say, okay, there is maybe some bias in the data and document that? Or do I have to make sure that it's biasless, but it's non-existent? And for instance, as a researcher in academia, you don't have access to all the data there, so you can only use part of it, for instance, for usage data on music. And there will be some bias, for instance, in the how, how to deal with that. So if you have, if there is the, the enforcement that it has to be biasless by means of some metrics, it could happen that you can't do any research at all. So it's, I've seen not, lots of challenges there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when we were talking about this sort of explainability and almost the transparency for trust and this idea that you know, even without AI, there's still a lot of you know, lying going on. This is super common even just in advertising and always has been. If you want to sell things, you kind of stretch the truth a little bit. And this not even really enforced legally, I mean, not even a lot of countries, I don't know, this idea of um, in the US you don't really have to be transparent about a lot of the things that go into products, where, you know, there are some laws here about being transparent about you know, 
ingredients and things like that. So we can't even really enforce this without thinking about how to enforce it in AI. And we were talking about the challenge that, um, you know, who is creating these laws and what sort of enforcement <coughs> is happening. Um, how to you know, how to get these laws to be ethical when a lot of the motivation for laws can sometimes be unethical. Go on a next slide. So yeah, that. <laughs> the sort of corporate involvement in government and, and, and how laws are passed can inherently be biased and is sometimes not very ethical. Well, actually, uh, applications go much faster than laws are approved or uh -huh. designed mm -hmm. or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, and you? Yeah, we, uh, we had a discussion about um, how to basically not reinvent the wheel, the wheel first, uh, so to have a look at what kind of guidelines uh, and ideas are maybe there regarding ethics uh, that mm -hmm. can just apply for using information retrieval, but in that process also to identify what might be special to music, and to music mm -hmm. information retrieval, and maybe not only to music, but to the arts maybe in general. Um, uh, then we discussed also um, about bias, that maybe um, avoiding bias is, uh, might be impossible. So, uh, uh, and then the question is of course how to deal with it, how to document it, uh, if you cannot avoid it completely, so what should we do with it? Uh, and then uh, also enforcing ethical guidelines yeah. and these bylaws, we are uh, discussing that is the example of GP GDPR was uh, was a really bad example of how to deal with this because in the end we didn't have we we have the same issues with our personal data, but we just have to fill more boxes in order to use their services. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we don't like. Yeah, well, in the afternoon, Andre will talk about some guidelines already, so we don't have to read the wheel. And um, just to add something to the enforcement, uh, like one thing, because we are in the context of ISMIC, uh, in the recent years, I think a positive uh, thing has been people opening up the data sets, mm -hmm. code, and mm -hmm. now we are seeing this in the website, like when people are submitting their papers, or when you are actually going through the papers, you can see these things. And uh, this has, in my opinion, improved uh, the quality of the papers, the uh, actual code and collaboration. So um, we can also extend it to the data sets themselves. Like this is in the last two years now, we have data set papers where when I started, that will be like almost impossible to be presented in easily. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I was showing to Andres this uh, paper from Google, I think, like one year ago, like uh, Timnit Gebru, Kate Crawford, uh, et al. Uh, they did this data, she's for data sets paper, which is like a, uh, they adapted it from, I think, medical practices. So it's about how you uh, document uh, many of these things and uh, like explaining explicitly which biases they saw in the data sets and whatnot. So I think not reinventing the wheel and gathering stuff like that could be easier. Great. So there are even more challenges. Uh, one challenge that the industry was posing is to identify innovators with the right solutions. And what are right solutions, perhaps you may ask. Uh, perhaps the lack of skilled people and how we can reskill workers in time. So, if you predict that this revolution will come into full force in 20 years, well, it's time, but we have to take our uh, measures. Uh, then, uh, digital literacy. So, actually, 50% um, of the world is connected to the internet, and 50% of the world is not connected. So, mm -hmm. there are different worlds in this world. Okay, so I think we can stop here and have lunch and we see us at 1, I think it's 1. Okay. Okay. Okay.